I would like to introduce you Michael from uh, United Nations Global Service Center, UN Mappers. And Michael will uh, have a, a 60 minutes um, panelist on the educational initiatives and platforms on OpenStreetMap. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. So, hi everyone. This panel was like really last minute because we had many changes like uh, until uh, 2 a.m. this night. <laughs> so I hope it will be uh, nice. So the idea is to have like a small introduction of the topics uh, that we will cover in this panel. Um, and then I will invite the panelists to, to, to discuss um, about the points that uh, we will be showing here. I will start with my usual pessimistic view of the world. Um, so in this graph, you can see like uh, there is a sample of OSM data. These are uh, OSM nodes. Um, and uh, on the on the y axis, we see the cumulative number of contributors. So basically, who contributed uh, how much nodes in this sample. And uh, as you see, like this is a power law distribution. So we see that like a few users are mapping uh, most of the data, like 5% uh, of the users are mapping like 95% of the data, while uh, the remaining 95% of the other users are mapping uh, the, a total of 5% of all the data. And this is, not, it, this is always true in every citizen science uh, project, not only OSM, and also is like scale independent. So you have like mapathons in which you have this same distribution as well as uh, entire communities or entire uh, mapping campaigns. So you always have that few users are like the expert ones and the others instead are the, um, let's say, um, are just uh, contributing maybe one thing and then they are leaving the, the project or the, uh, um, or the campaign. So maybe uh, I would like to ask you now in the, uh, in the, in the audience um, to raise your hands. I will ask some questions and make a poll. So uh, just to start, uh, who is now at the state of the map? So I guess everybody has to raise the hand. Okay. And then I uh, would like to ask um, how many of you know how to map a building on OSM? Okay. Um, how many of you um, read the weekly OSM? Okay, they are less than, than before. How many of you um, read the organized editing guidelines for uh, big, big organizations and companies? Okay, <laughs> we are diminishing. How many of you know the maximum uh, number of nodes of a way on OSM? Ah, only the nerds. It's 2,000. 2,000 nodes. And so I won't ask the maximum number of uh, members in a OSM relation <laughs> that is known. I mean, there is no limit. Okay, so you see, like, even in this experiment, we saw that most of the people know to do uh, very simple stuff, and uh, then few people are becoming, like, like, let's say, are the more expert than others because they know very <laughs> nerdy topics. So we can see that basically we have the expert in the yellow box and the I mean, I call them mayflies, but anybody, any, anyway, like a person that maybe contributes one time and then, and then disappears. So the data is contributed by a small, uh, a small expert pool of contributors, and there are like different ways to change, let's say, the skewness of this uh, curve. You can either train the contributors, that is the, the topic of today, so to create new experts. Other, and, and so, I mean, what we do by training people is to move people from the green box to the yellow one. Or otherwise, we can grow the community base. So if we know that 5% of the users uh, may become experts, we do like bigger events and we hope to catch uh, someone. Or to diversify the community, so to uh, expand uh, like to other countries or other communities that we don't know and to still, let's say, to find the, the, the experts in that community. There is a small world effect uh, because like uh, if you count that uh, we have around 5,000 daily users in OSM, daily contributors. Um, here in the uh, uh, state of the map, we are 500. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, there is a high probability that 
it's always us <laughs> that we are meeting in different forms, but uh, it's very hard to find new people now, to have new people joining. Um, together, I mean, within the activities, the crowdsourcing activities uh, that we are doing with UN mappers, we saw definitely one thing uh, that is basically, I mean, if you take like an example, the topographic editing, in which we may uh, edit everything from uh, residential areas to highways, waterways, and land cover. If we ask uh, the contributors to edit something that is similar, that, that is like very simple, like residential areas, this is pretty easy. You just open a project in the task manager and you will have uh, get it done. But if you want to map, for example, land cover, this is like the, the complexity of the task is much difficult, more difficult, and so, uh, basically, you have to provide an incentive to the individual to be able to produce this kind of data. And uh, basically, what happens is that maybe instead of uh, simply opening a project, you have to start a training course, or maybe you have to, to, be, to create something rewarding, like an internship program, a certificate, in order to award the, the person to do, let's say, one complex task. Um, so I will say that this is related to the data, but it is also related to, to people, because education is always, let's say, a driver to create a community. And basically, I think the end goal of every trainer in OSM would be to train other trainers. So maybe I'm happy when, let's say, I meet one person that was trained by, the, by a person that I trained, but maybe doesn't know me. So that, that would be very good. Um, and also, we don't have to have mappers that only know to map simple features, and maybe they don't know anything about uh, best practices, uh, procedures, and the data model of OSM. Like, for example, I trained, uh, I think, hundreds of people, and uh, I always find, uh, uh, let's say, 95% of the people that, at the beginning, they know only how to use ID editor, map a building, and that's it. Maybe they don't even know how to send a, a message on the OSM platform. Or, uh, uh, or maybe, I don't know, they know, don't know anything about the mailing lists, the, the community uh, organization, um, the foundation, and so on. The same holds for corporate editors, actually, because it may, may be that a professional is meeting uh, OSM like uh, as a, um, basically as a um, um, tool uh, that is using for work, and maybe it doesn't know about uh, the organized editing guidelines, the attributions, and uh, um, so, uh, basically, the education is also provi providing, let's say, this healthier environment um, in OSM. Um, and then we have also accessibility barriers often, especially when we uh, train people in the south, uh, because um, there are many um, fr francophone communities or maybe people that are speaking only, only Portuguese. Uh, in that case, it's uh, often very difficult to find in OSM material, educational material that is also translated in other languages. like. Um, uh, is uh, quite a challenge, or to have uh, at, at least trainings or courses that are uh, um, in, in other languages that are other than uh, English. And then, okay, the infrastructure, uh, obviously, like digital infrastructure is not sometimes available in, uh, um, in African communities. So, uh, some examples of what we have been doing with UN mappers. Uh, as uh, as um, Severan presented yesterday, we launched the um, uh, UN Maps Learning Hub which is an educational platform in which we are aiming to provide all the educational material on OSM uh, with a, um, up, up to now is specific to topographic editing, but the idea is to have like a, to cover other languages. We have uh, uh, English, French, Portuguese, uh, Spanish and Italian, but the idea is to cover all the UN official languages, so also Chinese, Arabic, um, uh, Russian and so on. And we also, um, let's say, during our trainings to the volunteers that we, um, that we are engaging with, we are also releasing certificates. They, these are like a, a life changer in a, for African communities. Like uh, you meet a young GIS professional and with a certificate released by the UN, uh, you can definitely change, uh, change his life because um, in Africa they use a lot these uh, professional certificates. And uh, we also have like a round of internships uh, for these uh, particular complex topics that we are, that we are uh, uh, features that we are, that we are mapping. Okay, so I will invite um, the panelists now to, to join me. Actually, uh, we had uh, like some changes now. Uh, we were thinking to have uh, people remotely, 
but uh, actually, I mean, we didn't manage in the end <laughs> because of the microphone uh, issues. So uh, I had to change finally like this night. Um, but we have a video from Stefan Keller. He's uh, um, a professor in a Switzerland University. Uh, then we, uh, I invite uh, uh, Jess Bettler. Uh, she is uh, um, the program director for SMUS, and she's supporting programs um, related to community um, impact ed education. And also, um, she is one of the founders of Teach SM, uh, which aims to uh, empower educators at all, at all levels to uh, integrate OSM in the uh, classrooms. Um, so please come. <laughs> Uh, well, you can come all together, actually. Nola, <laughs> please, an applause for the panelists now. <laughs> Benjamin and Sevran. So Nola, uh, maybe you, you know her already. She's, uh, um, she integrated the OSM in GIS courses since 2012. Um, she's co-founder of Youth Mappers uh, and also of Teach OSM. And then we have uh, uh, Benjamin. Um, he works in the Heidelberg University, um, and also he taught uh, OSM to students in Tanzania. And then we have Sevran. Sevran is uh, one colleague of us from UN Mappers. Uh, he is the, let's say, coordinator to, to, I mean, we refer to all the things that are uh, related to educational activities. Um, and, also, uh, and also he has an NGO uh, that provides, uh, um, let's say, French um, French trainings to um, francophone communities in Africa. Okay, I see the panelists now, but I would like to um, maybe start with the video from Stefan Keller, that is the only remote panelist for now. Just like a little mention to the remote panelists that uh, didn't uh, join us today. We had Madalina UNESCO, uh, UNESCO from, uh, um, from Romania. Uh, she is uh, uh, she she is the um, she ran like some Erasmus Plus projects uh, and also she she found she is one of the founders of Weekly SM and uh, it's very it's very I mean it I mean it's a pity that we don't have her because she has like a lot of experience in uh, teaching to high school students and uh, she had definitely many stories to tell us and then we had also Natalie Sidibe uh, from OSM Mali uh, but unfortunately we didn't manage to work for the remote. Uh, um, for the remote panelists. So please, an applause for the remote panelists that uh, didn't manage. End the video now. Hi, my name is Stefan Keller. I'm a professor for data engineering at the University of Applied Sciences, Eastern Switzerland, and a board member of the Swiss OpenStreetMap Association. I would like to introduce Open School Maps, a small project promoting open data and tools. It is mainly a collection of teaching materials about OpenStreetMap and open source software. The idea for Open School Maps comes from 2019 when it won an award in the best open educational project category for being open educational resources and for using the open format ASCII-Doc to manage feedback in a simple repository. Browse the educational materials for yourself. Currently, there are about 29 worksheets on the website, such as using the osm.org website in daily life, editing OpenStreetMap, organizing an outdoor mapping event, creating a map with UMAP, or an introduction to the open source geographic software QGIS. Visit openschoolmaps.org website. And the English material can be found at the very bottom. I wish you an interesting panel and a pleasant stay at the state of the map in Florence. Goodbye. We agreed on some discussion points and I mean, possibly the panelists will uh, um, also take example, examples from their uh, experience, uh, either with uh, the World Bank, uh, the Youth, Youth Mappers, uh, Teach OSM or uh, uh, hi, Git. Um, so we have some discussion points about the current offer of, of OSM training materials and platforms. So to understand among us, I mean, what is available out there um, and to see, I mean, uh, what, what is there actually, I mean, in which languages, uh, what, uh, who is do, doing on-site or uh, remote trainings. Um, 
then another topic will be to increase the knowledge base of volunteers. As I told you, like many people like know very, very few things about OSM, about only the editing and not maybe about the community or the, um, let's say, or the guidelines, the, the rules uh, that would be nice to follow in a, let's say, in the, in the community. Um, and then um, how to facilitate OSM trainings in uh, underdeveloped areas. Um, or also we can speak about the standardization of OSM material um, for adoption, for example, in universities, because I don't know if there is like a proper course uh, in any university uh, related only to OSM. And even, even I mean, if, even if there is, I don't know if they are covering, like, for example, the community topics or only the, only the editing. Um, and then we have a question from Madalina that didn't join. Uh, so why do you train a mapper? What is your goal? And do you want only to train people or you want to educate them? Which is like a uh, difference between, uh, I think, uh, training a person to edit something or training a mapper to be like uh, a part of the community and maybe uh, also create con communities uh, in, a, in a, his own. Um, so also the audience, I mean, if you have any questions that you would like to ask or um, any comments, feel free to, to, to intervene and I will uh, come, with, uh, come to you with the, with the microphone. So, I don't know who would like to start. <laughs> Maybe Sevran. Yeah, I mean, I, it's up to you, as you wish. Um. <clears throat> Um, I, I'm not sure. We, uh, I, I think maybe the four of us, we, we, we can cover uh, the, the first point. I'm not sure we, we, we can actually uh, be sure about uh, what is the, the total offer, what we can have uh, regarding our some training materials and platform. Um, I know that the, the most common uh, known one, uh, uh, Learn OSM, I, th I think it was the first one has to, did, wanted to, to have something complete and in different, different languages. I've been involved in that, uh, translating in French, but it was back in 2013. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's really forked in different languages and they uh, a bit living their, their own life uh, separately. Um, and it's really uh, based on um, knowing many things about OpenStreetMap. It's not, and it's really teaching um, material. You will learn things, but uh, you don't have uh, exercises or, or things like that, uh, just to, to, to learn uh, um, how to use um, different tools of OpenStreetMap. And also we use the, 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 um, the data a bit. Um, I said yes, we have also to cover uh, remote training. So yes, learn OSM. Uh, I let you speak about uh, teach OSM and uh, what uh, you wanted to 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 cover. Um, uh, material and platforms. Um, we know that there's some uh, individual publishing uh, some, um, uh, for example, um, courses or something like this or videos. Um, I, I don't remember this. Um, uh, lady, I think it's from Ireland, and she published some uh, materials in uh, in YouTube uh, uh, frequently, uh, covering things that she she maps and but uh, she it, it, it's an interesting. And uh, as uh, we uh, already said, we we, we launched uh, the the UN Mappers platform uh, yesterday. Um, we're trying to to fill a gap by um, proposing something. It's really uh, the same course in. Uh, uh, at, as of now, five different languages, and we include exercises, um, quizzes, and um, that's something that is uh, beyond the, I mean, just the training things, but the kind of motivation. Uh, we, we aim at uh, pro uh, creating something that will uh, propose a final certification of um, OSM proficiency uh, if you, um, um, uh, manage to uh, to pass all the all the all the quizzes and maybe also some uh, practice session that we we would review. Um, that's uh, for this. Uh, just we can start uh, regarding the the remote material. And then I don't know. Take talk about what is uh, uh, currently available regarding uh, remote trainings, or I mean just uh, with uh, uh, remote or in or, or on site, but the trainings. Uh, 
Yeah, um, we have two of us that can talk about Teach Awesome. So a quick correction, Nola was there at the founding, I'm pretty new to it, but um, as far as Teach OSM, so we are working with a very um, niche part of this community. We're really, um, throughout the life of the program, it's been really aimed at empowering educators and students uh, to learn through OpenStreetMap in classrooms and other educational settings. So what we offer um, is a bit more complementary to like the Learn OSM and those other um, those other training materials that exist. Of course, we have the how to map a building, um, but a lot of what we're providing is um, lesson plans and structure and um, trainings for teachers, um, not just how to use OpenStreetMap and how to train their students in OpenStreetMap, um, but it's also about the larger concepts of why even map um, and also um, teachers they're not a lot of the teachers that we are working with or we're trying to bring into this community they're not going to be teaching an osm course they're teaching geography they're teaching social social sciences um, so it's also how do you integrate OpenStreetMap into those subjects so we've been working on having materials and lessons in these subjects as well as a lot of case studies. Um, yeah, so as far as like on-site remote trainings, there has been a lot of in-person trainings in the past, um, but in the past few years, as everyone has experienced, a lot of that's gone remotely. Um, and one thing that we've found working with educators is having continued practice and continued touch points builds that confidence um, that allows them to feel comfortable bringing this technology into their classroom. Um, and so like we've been hosting map belongs where people, where teachers and others in our community can come together, you know, virtually and practice mapping. So that's just, yeah, my overview of things. Thanks, Jess. There's not a lot I can add to what uh, Severin and Jess have said about that. We all know there's good content out there, and I think it's important to not to, to recognize the good content that is there and reuse it and acknowledge it. Um, I think what we found a lot with uh, educators in particular is that they're overwhelmed by what is out there and they don't know what is right and what is good and what procedure. And I think what they need help with is curating what is out there already and, and bringing it under their, their topic or under their subject matter. So when, when Teach OSM was set up initially, it was initially based on requests from uh, university faculty that were like from other departments. They really wanted to do this, but they didn't know how to bring it in. They needed like a use case. They wanted to know what was important, what they needed to include. So that was kind of how, why we set that up to kind of help them do their own curation as it fit within their own subject. So I do think there's good stuff out there. I think the overwhelming part is there is so much of it and, and deciding what the right quality is. And, and I think, you know, if you work in different thematic areas, there's always going to be a burden of curation. You're always going to have to help people distill down what is important for them. And there's a burden on making sure that you you hit all those points. Um, that's something that we've just done now with the Youth Mappers Academy as well, because you know we would provide trainings either virtually or in person to our students, and then they would in turn train, go on down the line. But kind of while you know you could get steered wildly in pointing to all these different resources. So what we did with the academy was we sat down and we distilled what do they need to know at a minimum across all these things. And one of the things that we found missing in, in, in teaching material perhaps was those things, like you said, do, do people know about the foundation? Do they know about the code of ethics and, and, and how they should behave, not just how to map a building? So things like that that we put into that pedagogy to make sure that that was in there. So the stuff is out there, it just, that, that curation of it is something we need to do better at, and definitely um, more languages in that. Great, yeah, so I agree with the point that maybe many, or I think most of the material might be um, to ma towards how to map and how to map better and how to map more complex. So in the setting where I work at, at Heidelberg University, we often like try to use OSM data more for analysis to create maps or to, I don't know, derive like certain yeah, derivative products out of it. And I think there I often end up creating my own material again, although there might be something already out there. And maybe also for use mappers, I think more and more you go also in this direction and the material exists, but I also don't know where I should make my material available that people could start to reuse. So 
yeah, that's that's a challenge for me at least. And yeah, maybe that's something we can also discuss with the bigger audience. What would be good approaches to make this more visible, or if you tried out something which which works for you, that would be interesting to to learn here. Okay, so I don't know if anybody in the audience like uh, would like to cite maybe any other uh, uh, learning uh, platform that uh, you know or maybe you are offering. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, so at Crowd to Map, we also have some training materials and badges and um, quizzes. So it would be really great to collaborate more so that we're not all, uh, you know, duplicating effort. Um, and um, this is a question about Teach OSM, really. Um, I haven't looked at the platform recently, I must admit, and um, it, it, we're really trying to involve more schools in, in Tanzania, and I wondered if um, you have any materials that are, are suitable for, you know, more low resource settings um, and less well mapped areas, um, because I think that would be something that we're really interested in developing. Sorry, I would like uh, to uh, ask also to the audience, I mean, for the remote uh, audience, uh, um, to introduce yourself so that you, I mean, they know who you are. Sorry, I'm Janet from Crowd to Map, Tanzania. Thank you. So just to summarize what you were asking, essentially um, materials on um, how to how to do this, how to bring um, OSM to classrooms in low resource settings, correct? And the benefits of maps. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing um, that's um, great about Teach OSM, so we, we say the platform, Teach OSM has a website with the, the learning modules and all of those materials, and then there's also the tasking manager separate from that. Um, the lesson plans and those materials, anyone can submit to them. Um, and I think that that's something that I would love to see from um, groups like OSM Uganda is doing amazing work with OSM in schools, and they're going to be a much better source for that information than I would be. Um, and so all of the lesson plan, those lesson plans are available, anyone can contribute to them. Um, and so I would, I would push that back to the community um, and something that we'd be willing to work with um, to help make that happen, because making materials and making lesson plans are not easy, um, but also recognizing that, that that local knowledge is really valuable. So that's something that we would be happy to collaborate with communities. Um, we just need to connect with them to get those materials on, because, yeah, that's very important. A lot of the materials we have right now are have been you know, developed um, largely at the request of, say, like a United States high school, um, but that's a very different, um, you know, it serves a different need than in Tanzania or Uganda. So it's something that we want to collaborate with, and there is space for that. Okay. Somebody in the audience would like to... Yes? Are you right? Hello, everyone. I'm Susma Gimiri, uh, currently working at Kathmandu Living Lab. Yeah, my journey with OSM started when I was a student and uh, I was uh, taught mapping and now I am an OSM trainer too. So in my experience, I have uh, found that while training uh, training people in real, uh, the kind of enjoy when uh, I gamify the OSM training sessions, right? When I turn the simple uh, things like map building in OSM, when I tell them, uh, find the house find your house in open sheet map. And if you don't find your exact house, please map that. Uh, when I put the things like that, then they kind of uh, take it as a challenge or ins get inspired, motivated, whatever you can say. And they uh, try to feel the OSM map. They go through the open sheet map in more detail and find their building. And if they do not find, they actually contribute to open sheet maps. Yeah, this was just an example I was giving. So this kind of gamifying experience uh, uh, quite uh, a level of the training experience for mappers, right? So how do you think you can uh, embed these kinds of techniques and tools in developing materials and module uh, for the OSM trainings in up upcoming days? Yeah. Thank you. If I can add also one uh, comment, 
I think gamification is fine when you are uh, maybe inviting people to discover the map to map other features, but when gamification is based on the quantity of data that you edit, I mean, that could be like quite dangerous <laughs> because like you may have like people uh, like trying to edit as much as they can and maybe like not exploring other other features in the in the map. So it has to be uh, considered. Yes. I think it speaks to a good point, maybe not about gamification itself, but how do you get the people really being excited about OpenStreetMap? And you get to that point when you show them, look, your house is not mapped and you can make a change. And this little change already makes them realize that this is different from Google Maps or other maps. And I think this is the critical point, maybe, and not the, the gamification aspect of it, but more like the power to be able to change something. And yeah, how can we maybe foster this more and more to, to allow people to feel this? Yeah. I totally agree with you, Benny. And I think, again, it's all about context. Uh, you know, in, in your situation, you're dealing with a certain audience with certain motivations. Like in Janet's context, you know the problem you're addressing. So you need, you know the tools you need to teach in order to address that problem. I think when you're teaching mapping and kind of like an open education education setting, like Richard and I started teaching it as part of a very traditional GIS class, you need a hook, you know, why is this different? So we chose to teach OSM through what we call service learning. So we partnered with somebody, uh, a USAID initially, we've worked with the Red Cross, we've worked with the World Bank. And there was always a story. We were partnering with somebody to create data that mattered. And, and some of our students who might not have been as interested in an assignment because I just told them go there and map stuff or create some basic data, there was kind of a sense of, you know, I got to do this right because this is actually going to be used for something. Um, and there was a backstory to it. And, and that, that, that use case and that service partnership also allowed us to teach things like ethics and why we do it properly and why it's important to get it right. So you can kind of weave all that into the narrative of how, how you teach. And we've, 12 years now, we've been doing it this way. And that's how we have always taught this stuff. And we went from having a small module within a GIS class, to now we have an entire open source class that, you know, OSM is a big part, but we move it through all the open source software. So it's kind of all the way from like start to the finish. Um, so yeah, I, it, that, that has worked really, really well for us and it can work in so many contexts. It doesn't have to be about development work. It can be about working with your local community and, and things to do with accessibility in your neighborhood. It can be bike lanes. It can be, there's so many ways to do that. There's, there's a lot of potential. And to touch on Michael's point about gamification, because that's definitely um, something that we've seen a lot in the community, especially with students. It's, it's, students want to have that competition. Um, but there's also creative ways you can have that gamification outside of the data. And we had a teacher um, share her story with us recently of like an idea she came up with. She teaches earth sciences and she was teaching about earthquakes and where she put the gamification was before the mapping. Um, so she was teaching about earthquake risk and her students had to create pitches about why their area was more the most vulnerable to earthquakes. And they had to, that was the competition and the, the group that won the class at the end of the day, they mapped that part of the world. Um, so you can still have that gamification, that, motiv that motivation um, and the causes to uh, Nola's point um, without touching on the quality issues as well. Um, regarding the motivations, uh, uh, there are also uh, different uh, regarding the, the regions uh, we are talking about. You know, this is between, let's say, uh, north and south, it can be different. Uh, I was raised in France, I live in Brazil, and I, I worked a lot in, in Africa, so I, I can see the different uh, motivation we, we can find here and there. Um, uh, I, I try to engage, uh, try to start local communities by teaching people, and uh, it's very different from one place to another. It's complicated, I would say. Um, when we, you, you teach, uh, I would say, France and Brazil, because I, I know them, uh, generally this is something you, you will uh, start uh, organizing, I would say, more with the teacher than uh, the, the students. The students is just one topic. Uh, they are 
not very aware of and um, maybe, maybe one of the, there's always the one percent of uh, the attendee in a, or the trainees in our uh, in OSM that you, it will catch the thing and will become an active mapper for for four years and the rest would be would not uh, be very interested so um, after many years of training people in Africa and when you propose that you have dozens of people that uh, would like to, to join because uh, this is an opportunity for them to have um, uh, practical uh, GIS uh, uh, lessons that they, they generally they have only you and I mean there you you know there is uh, African people it's difficult to have in the university some uh, GIS practical sessions so there is this opportunity through OpenStreetMap that is really something they, 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 they didn't want to miss. And the contrary, on, on the north, uh, you propose that and you have only five students uh, who applied. But what, what the heck, what's the difference? So um, yes, the motivations can, can be different. That's, I mean, the first motivation. And after that, um, the continuation of it, because uh, sometimes also, um, you know that in the south, you have a limited uh, hobby time. So uh, you, you cannot, uh, I mean, spend hours a day uh, mapping uh, online and it's costly because you don't have a, a, a high uh, bandwidth, uh, high, how do you say that, uh, a high bandwidth uh, internet uh, that is not uh, costful at all. No, you have to pay a bundle for it and it's really costful uh, uh, for your means. And um, so, yes, it's complicated. So, and also, there's um, beyond the education um, and uh, the the students or the, the people, the, the young people that engage in OpenStreetMap, they expect something that will change their, their, their living, that we provide some opportunities uh, in terms of uh, jobs or, or, or things like that. And they can, they can uh, also um, uh, be a bit disappointed because, okay, we gather, we make map pattern mapping parties, and at the end, okay, I'm still a student, I don't have any money, and it can, it can cost me the internet and something, so they know they, they drop the thing. And regarding the hobby time, it's even worse for the ladies, because generally, uh, yes, I have, you know the young African, the guys, you know, all the, the ladies, they do not participate a lot in, uh, in the, in the um, uh, activities we do, yes, because they have also uh, work to do, enfin, homework to do uh, at home, and those, uh, they, they have uh, less opportunity. So yes, education is, um, is uh, something also that, I mean, uh, touch different things and different contexts and uh, it's even more complicated in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in context where um, the, the time and the money are less uh, available. That was all the discussion we had uh, yesterday also with the local chapter things. So um, remote and say that uh, for for the trainings uh, uh, themselves beyond the the, the, mat the the material and the platform, this is something that I think also uh, uh, that would be maybe a question to 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 have to the crowd. Uh, who are you are, are active mappers? I would say because you you may also uh, be in the state of the map even being a, a, a mapper. We'd like to know who are mappers. Okay. Uh, who, are, um, um, I mean, know the OpenStreetMap all by online materials. You, I mean, you, you learn by yourself. Or did you have any um, learning session by someone else? You can be remotely down or uh, on site. Raise your hands. Okay, so that's, I would say half, half, but maybe some uh, some people raise their the, the hand at two times. So yes, you can see that, uh, you see uh, on this uh, smaller sample that uh, we have the, the, the platform there, they can fill a gap, but also that people that uh, uh, also learn by, uh, by, um, by um, a training session. So it's also something that's very important. This is, uh, something that um, is also costful to organize. I mean, you have to either to be a teacher or a volunteer teacher, but uh, you also uh, need to do that uh, for your living. So um, uh, it's um, something, I don't know uh, how many uh, initiatives there is to organize uh, either remote or uh, on-site trainings. I was part of something, it was, uh, 
in the past, the train many many people in uh, uh, Western Africa, especially French-speaking people, uh, countries, it doesn't exist anymore. So it's something that is missing. And uh, um, I think there's um, remote trainings, yes, but on-site trainings, uh, I think there are a bit declining now uh, regarding what uh, a few years ago there was many more projects involving teaching people uh, directly in the field and this is um, maybe uh, um, this is appearing a bit and I think it's unfortunately unfortunate because uh, it's really important for for um, I mean growing the, the knowledge of uh, of potential uh, future active mappers. Yeah, touching on your point about in-person trainings, because yeah, the, especially the past few years, it's been really difficult to, to have that. And even before then, it takes a lot of resources to um, both on the organizer side, but also the people attending, especially if you're in a developing country, just getting to a training site has its challenges. Um, but one thing that actually um, I would love to see more of, and we've seen great success, is having one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So having OSM mappers connecting directly with an educator. Um, they might not have, you know, the education background. They might not be, you know, um, themselves a trainer, but just having um, someone that, that educator or maybe students, maybe youth mappers group, um, either way, they can reach out when they have questions is maybe a model that we can explore a bit more. Um, we've seen that, um, or I've seen that successfully in the US of um, teachers just partnering up with a local mapper and then they could ask questions, you know, why is an ID editor loading properly? You know, just having someone there and they don't even have to be in person, but just having someone that can be there for them when they have those questions. That's also something that maybe we can be looking into more as a community. I think uh, you touched uh, a nice point because like uh, yesterday, you know, we participated to the Congress of the local communities and we saw this thing that basically, um, you know, uh, communities um, and education like are two topics that are going uh, along with. Uh, so basically, I mean, would be nice to have like some platforms or some ways to, as you suggest, like to put in, in touch like people with trainers or educators in such a way that everybody can uh, um, say receive uh, feedback uh, in a prompt way uh, would be really, really wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Um, so at, at crowd to map um, we have a Slack channel that's been pretty good for um, giving feedback to new remote mappers. Um, so, that, you know, there's been coaches and so on, and that, that's worked quite well. Um, we also have uh, WhatsApp groups for um, field mappers. Um, so they've been doing a lot of training that way and ask, asking questions. So there is like a coach um, in, in that group, um, and that's worked pretty well too. Okay, so um, basically you have a channel, um, a communication channel that you use for, uh, for this type of coaching. Yes. Yes, uh, I, I don't have a question, but uh, there is a question in the venue list channel. Uh, is there an educational working group in OSM Would that help bringing cohesion like a focus point or something? Yeah. Nice question. I, don't, I, know, I know that there is one in OSM Italia because we are part of it, also in the OSM US, but uh, is there any working group in the OSMF? If you know, <laughs> there. Okay, my name is Rai Ahmada. I'm from Zanzibar, uh, Youth Mapper's Regional Ambassador. Uh, the fact that I'm uh, also an assistant lecturer at the State University of Zanzibar, I was thinking of uh, uh, seeing of how we adopt the OSM content into universities, maybe for by piloting them, like what we do with youth mappers. Uh, youth mappers are chapters, but in in um, in my area, it's like a students club. 
So it's something that uh, the students like uh, get used to it. And we, uh, what I was thinking also, it, uh, we could uh, like think of integrating that into programs in the universities, like the industrial training program, in which it's like uh, we have eight months where the students are exposed to fieldwork. So maybe we could like uh, use the available materials. And then from there, we could curate the data well and contextualize based on the area because we have different situations. For example, in my area, I believe it's different from, for example, in America or in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you. So only, only to resume the other question, I don't know if there is any working group in the SMF about education. Okay, apparently not. So do you want to answer? There? Yeah, since we are talking about the communication channel for uh, new beginner OSM mappers, right? And we talk there exist a Slack channel uh, where people are always available for help. But in case of countries like Nepal, from where I come, uh, the digital literacy is so low, and map literacy is so low, and uh, I don't think I can ever get uh, the people who I, I am training to the Slack platform, right? Because in case of Nepal, Facebook is quite popular. I kind of can manage to get them to the Facebook. I kind of create Facebook groups and uh, talk with them, establish communication with them, but it's very difficult to uh, get them to Slack and get the help they need on their own. So yeah, these kinds of exist in the underdeveloped areas or countries like Nepal. So I think we should also work on uh, creating a cross-platform where uh, the participants can get to learn more easily. Yeah, that's what I want to add. Thank you. So I saw two emerging topics one is the, let's say, availability of a uh, communication channel whenever, I mean, for coaching, whenever the internet connection is available. And on the other side, the importance of on-site trainings and to have like people there that are able to train other people. So like without, let's say, having to be coached anymore. Somebody would like to add uh, some points on this, these two considerations? So another thing that I see um, that I, I mean, I felt during our trainings, uh, we, we trained many local communities in, uh, with UN mappers, um, especially in African countries, uh, but also, let's say, in the uh, academic world, because we have like, well, we trained uh, many students in the universities in uh, Africa and, uh, and Europe. I noticed uh, sometimes there is the uh, so-called the language barrier because uh, for example, if we train some people in, uh, uh, in Brazil, uh, probably the best language to speak is uh, Portuguese, but it's very hard to find the uh, OSM material in, uh, in Portuguese. So, like, I think uh, definitely there will be a need for, uh, I mean, an effort to, to produce and translate um, the, the educational material. And also better maybe to have, like, trainings directly in uh, uh, other languages rather than, than English. So this is something that we are covering actually with the uh, Learning Hub. I mean, we are trying to uh, translate as possible uh, all the material we produce and also to have trainings uh, that are not in English, like, because it's much easier for, uh, uh, I mean, for the people to, to, be, to be taught in their, uh, in their native language. Um, okay, I don't know. <laughs> Perfect. Nice. And another question? Yes. So I will read now the questions. Uh, when establishing the learning hub for the, for the UN maps, you consider to create, to create the OSM wiki page, um, category education, which often are outdated. Um, I don't get the question, actually. 
I think the the uh, the audience ask uh, when you create this UN Mapper learning page, have you considered the related page already in the wiki uh, of OpenStreetMap, which have this tag of uh, category uh, education, uh, al although it was often not really uh, frequently updated, but maybe it can be integrated in the future. So. Yes, definitely. I think uh, I mean we can definitely list the the the, the learning hub in in that page. Uh, yeah. Another question. This one. Apart from teaching OSM in schools, do you plan also to provide these trainings materials to uh, to people outside schools, apart from mapathons? Uh, well, I think uh, all of us know. To everybody. So regarding the UN mappers, yes, I mean, the Learning Hub will be uh, available to everybody to use. And actually, I mean, we are not training only students. We are training the UN personnel on the field. So we are uh, teaching uh, OSM editing to, uh, to the peacekeeping personnel. I don't know for, uh, for you. One question. Um, you said it's available to use, and I'm not sure about uh, teacher OSM. When we come back, let's say, to the core principles of OSM, kind of, everyone can also edit and change. How do you incorporate that? So would it be possible for me to change something in your training material or in Teach OSM training material? Or is that not planned? Because I think that would allow everyone here, right, to adjust the content to their local context to, I don't know, maybe, maybe this would be what, what would help most of us. but. I don't know, what do you think about it? Um, yeah, I mean, essentially how the, the content exists on our site right now, it's just in PDFs that people upload, um, which has its own challenges with translation and everything, um, but we would welcome that assistance if people have ideas on how we can make that more accessible. Um, there are structures that we, you know, way it, some of this has been designed is because it is how a lot of educators digest this material, which is the target audience, um, but would totally welcome ideas and assistance on how we can improve localization. It's something we're um, very aware is needed and something we want, but operating on mostly volunteers and low resources. So that's something we'd welcome assistance on improving, I would say. And I think there, there's kind of two streams to, to what we serve on Teach OSM. It initially started as content to help university faculty, um, and it kind of became more overwhelmingly focused on high school, and those teachers wanted it very scripted, because this was really going outside the scope of what they did previously, and they were already overburdened, so they needed a, a lot of help to put that together. Whereas from the university perspective, it was more like almost like a recipe. People wanted to know how I could possibly integrate, and they were going to use their own ingredients, but they wanted to see that structure, and they wanted examples of how others did it. So that, in a way, lends itself really well to just kind of staying there and being translated, because we weren't providing any, like, training content we were pointing them to learn because like, i think one of the important things that we've tried to do with the the new youth mappers academy and that content is i don't want to reinvent the wheel i respect what my colleagues have created it is how i learned how to do this for the last 10 years so i am using all the good stuff that's out there already and i'm pointing to it which begs to that question there exactly linked to things that are being curated and maintained and and, and then obviously you have to check that they are indeed doing that um, but it's more about streamlining it and giving people a path to follow so that they know where to look, but that they're you're not assaulted with all this material. I have something that is more a question for you, because um, uh, regarding the one of the points is the adoption uh, of uh, in an OSM in, I would say, the academic curriculum. Uh, because for UN mappers, we we, well, we have the training um, platform and we, we can deliver certificates. But uh, I mean, the UN are not uh, uh, a new university. Um, what uh, is there a, a step of really? Uh, in, I mean, including now uh, OpenStreetMap as um, in GIS. Um, I mean, uh, lectures course that is really something that we would part of uh, the the education. Uh, uh, of 
of official educational material because uh, as of now it seems to be like a bit of uh, an extra like uh, let's say you you say that at the beginning that uh, some teacher they would like to 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 teach OSM but it's they, they they lack materials but um, I know in uh, other uh, context uh, that uh, there is no open street map course or uh, I don't know uh, or just something that would be inserted in a in a, um, in a classic GIS uh, course or something that would be uh, an open source and open data uh, uh, GIS course that would be uh, officially uh, uh, taught and with uh, something like uh, yes you have a degree for that is there something on the way um, regarding this Um, I think one of the challenges with this kind of thing, and actually Rhea and I talked about that um, earlier in the week, is that universities all over the world are different. And the level of formalization when it comes to curriculum are completely different. Like in the US, we have a lot of bandwidth to create our own content. You know, sometimes your syllabus is approved at the department level, but maybe not beyond that. So we have a lot of latitude to include these things. So it's great flexibility. You know, we went from having it as a module that was tried and tested to now we have a whole class while it's not OSM, OSM is the cornerstone because OSM is part of a larger ecosystems of softwares and open approaches. And so that's what that class is. We had the bandwidth to do that in the US. I'm back home now in Ireland. You can't just make up classes and teach them as you might like. There is a very strict protocol how these things get approved. And like Rhea was talking about the example in Zanzibar, she said that would also be the same. And it would take a lot of time and a lot of, of approval to, to formalize it, where you will kind of get away with modules. So you, you kind of sneak it in and see how it works and do whatever you have to do to, to get it off the ground. And even with Richard and I, it, it was a proof of concept for a long time to get traction. So I, I think that's hard because it's not universal. Okay, thank you for uh, your intervention. We have one minute left. And the last question, whether we should create a channel education in community.openstreetmap.org, I think is a nice idea. And also, I think, uh, I mean, we will be using this platform even more because, I mean, it's definitely the way, the way to go no, for the communication channels uh, between, uh, between uh, communities. Okay, perfect, thank you. So, applause for the panelists.